Uh, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Uh, this is, um, I, you know what, let me practice something because over the next uh, month we're going to be part of Connected uh, Educator Month, I think that if, if I have the right name there, and we, we need to introduce ourselves better. I was, uh, so um, we're, uh, we're a webcast here every Wednesday night um, over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network, and um, the, um, and many of us uh, participate uh, through writing projects and other ways. Uh, but you know what, um, Joe, and one of the things we do is we respond to emergent, interesting things people are bringing up. So Joe Dillon put out a, um, a tweet the other day and said, um, why isn't there a hashtag for EdTech equity? So we thought that would be a cool thing to talk about. So he graciously said he would come on, and um, we've invited some other people with us um, here tonight. Uh, so welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Uh, you know what, Ed Word um, Gonzalez? I'm going to pick on you since you're uh, you just joined us um, out of the out of the blue here. So why don't you introduce yourself, and then we'll get around to introducing everyone else. Okay, uh, my name is Edward Gonzalez. I teach at Lindsay High School in the central San Joaquin Valley of California, three hours from Los Angeles, three hours from San Francisco, three hours from Pismo. So we're, uh, we're pretty much in the center here. And um, I love uh, everything going through with EdTech. I just happened to see a EdTech equity link, and I clicked it. It sent me to a site. I clicked one more time, and around the fourth click, I saw four faces <laughs> on the screen, and I thought, all right, so this is cool. new to me. <laughs> so what, what, what is it about EdTech equity that uh, drew you in? Um, with this part, it's, this part's interesting to me because I, before I came here, I also substitute taught a lot in Los Angeles, and um, I was in the like in Watts and South Central and Boyle Heights, and so I saw it's it's the same the same students in the areas I I, I was in, and and also um the the economics were the same, but I feel at least being here in the area where I am that there's a lot less. Although my although my school has um one to one devices, there I see less opportunities for kids to have a. Uh, De uh, devices, and I think part of it, I mean, I, sorry, I don't want to mean to take up too much time, but one of the things that I, I came across on my own is I think there's a lot more like swap meets and things like that where kids can get a hold of um, like third-hand iPhones and third-hand um, little devices, whereas over here there isn't that much, uh, there isn't that much technology that, that could be spared, because when I would be in Los Angeles, I felt like I saw a lot more high-end, at least third, or uh, Hand-me-downs, but I saw a lot more high-end devices than I than I'd seen than I've seen over here. Cool. Well, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, where do we want to go, Joe? Why don't you jump in and introduce other people here, and then we'll keep going. Here. You want me to introduce others or introduce yourself, yourself? first? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so I'm Joe Dillon, and I'm I, I'm coming from Denver, but I work at, in a. Uh, large urban suburb just east of here, Aurora, Colorado, in the Aurora Public Schools, and I work in ed tech. And I'm also, you know, a longtime participant in the Denver Writing Project, and I've collaborated on several national writing project um, initiatives. And so that's why I, you know, when I felt the urge to tweet out, you know, ed tech equity and how might we think about an open channel for conversations about ed tech equity, I wanted to reach out to NWP, minded folks and those networks. So, and then I invited Colleenis from my district because um, she comes to us from the superintendent's office and we have, you know, a really strong um, voice as we got, we've got a new superintendent as of last year and a really strong voice around equity. And so we've been talking a lot about equity in our school district and I, you know, I, I like the idea of making these conversations a little bit more public and openly networked. So I welcome to Colleenis. Please welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself? First time on TTT, so welcome. Yeah, this is my first time on Google Hangout. There you go. <laughs> um, thank you so much for inviting me, Joe, and I'm just really looking forward to the conversation about how we can uh, talk a little bit about equity, especially um, in, the, in the tech realm um, for students who, in our district, um, have some significant challenges around resources in particular. So. Um, you know, finding ways to 
um, mobilize them, not just in the classroom, but also um, outside of it. And I don't know if Joe's talked a little bit about this, but we have some interesting um, demographics in our district um, that are a lot different and I think unique to um, to us. So we look very different, not too different, but a little bit more different than um, Denver, but it's it's pretty it's pretty awesome. So I'm just looking forward to the conversation. Can you break that down a little bit since you said it? What is the difference? That you well, we have one of the largest refugee populations in the state. I think we might even have the largest. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have students, and Joe, help me out here. We have students from Nepal. Um, we have students from um, Somalia, Ethiopia, other parts of Western Africa. Um, give me some additional ones. Do you have any? Well, and I, I will. I don't want to start making up statistics, but I will say that we have a, a huge swath of diversity. And in a recent visit to, to a local K-8 school, I just walked in, and two, one boy was experiencing kind of a, a typical challenge, and he'd come straight from Afghanistan with his family, and he was. And I just, you know, as I was trying to catch up with an ed tech coach and meet with some teachers, I was able to kind of listen in on the challenges that he was having because there were sort of birth certificate challenges and you know and, and he'd been put in the 11th grade for a few days and now they were had gotten him it figured out that he really belonged in 8th grade and yeah. you know just the idea of when we try to greet refugee students and be ready for them and respond i think that's where the diversity we know we know it's an asset but on days like that it does feel like it challenges us and we want to meet those challenges better all the time yeah. great and um, Monica, could I have you introduce yourself and catch us up a little bit with what you're up to? Sure. I'm in um, Longmont, Colorado, so not too far away um, from these guys. Um, and my focus has been equity. Um, and I think I, just from some experimenting and um, with spaces of permission where people have nothing to prove, um, and how do we get to a sustainable um, system? And it, I, I think it really does fall back on a, a bigger, a bigger ecosystem than um, what a lot of us are able to work with in the confines of um, policy and whatnot. So what I would throw in there is the equity piece. Um, for a lot of people, to me, equity is getting a go every day. Um, everyone getting a go every day, and so to me, as as well as having Wi-Fi and as well as having technology, um, having a, a connected device, um, having that free time. Because if if we give people equal things, or not even equal but equitable things, but then we go ahead and say what they need to do with those things, um, I don't think that's equity. Hmm. Well, cool. so yep. Um, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, Nicole. Yeah, there you go. Hi, everybody. I, ho I hope that you can hear me. Uh, I apologize. I'm actually at a Starbucks, so it's I'm taking fine. advantage of public public Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> but I've taught for uh, five years high school English in uh, New York City and Los Angeles, and I'm currently based in Los Angeles uh, doing research at UCLA. Uh, and I work with the National Writing Project to help think about these issues of what connected learning means and what does it mean to, to introduce students to digital forms of learning and expression in an equitable way. So I'm really excited that Joe started this conversation and I'm excited to, to share and learn from everyone tonight. And Chris Sloan. And then we'll jump in here. Yeah, uh, my name is Chris Sloan and I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City. Um, by the way, we had a request from the chat room to use lower thirds if you know how to do that uh, in keeping with Paul's idea of um, you know everyone introducing themselves. Um, so I didn't want to introduce that little tech thing, but um, just thought I would. Um, but um, I'm interested in this conversation because uh, I teach in Salt Lake City, Utah, which a lot of people 
would, um, you know, in Utah you might assume there's, um, you know, like there's a lot of Caucasian people. Um, but, you know, I think this year I have more students of color in different uh, socioeconomic um, diversity than I have before, so I'm more interested in the topic, I guess, than, than I ever have been. And just to say, um, I am Paul Olson, and I teach uh, second year uh, school. <laughs> we just started a school two years ago in the Bronx for kids uh, who nobody else wants to work with is one way I'll put that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so it's a pretty exciting time. The um, And I just, um, one of the, I don't want to make this uh, an obvious question, but one of the questions that has been asked um, is, the whole interest um, thrust, uh, and then Joe, you can put your own um, twist on all this, but um, that when we give students freedom to and encouragement to follow their interests, follow their passions, build their own networks, and find their own mentors and so forth, are we giving um, unfair advantage to kids who have who are of means? Um, because that's easier for them to do than kids who don't have means. So that's one of the questions that boils around when I think about equity issues here, um, given our context of ed tech. But Joe, so uh, so let's j can we just go around and hear like what questions are in the back of your mind about this issue at this point? You know, don't answer mine. Come up with your own. But, no, yeah, yeah I'll, let, I'll let yours sit, and I just I think. Uh, a couple things. Like one thing that happened this year was at the very beginning of the year when we do kind of district in service, which probably looks a lot, looks pretty similar at at school districts all over the nation. Maybe um, we tried to take a more uh, loose structure inside ed tech offerings, and we tried to to use ed, um, ed camp and unconference style structures. And so that was exciting because it provided teachers choice and it sort of functions as kind of a needs assessment for my department because I work in the ed tech department. And uh, although I try to sneak into as many literacy classrooms as I can. Um, and as teachers were kind of co-constructing the agendas, we, we led several sessions and every time a few teachers slapped up, you know, ed tech equity. They wanted to have a session on ed tech equity. Hmm. And I was always really excited to get around to those sessions and see what happened and invariably, the rooms where teachers were, you know, learning together about Google Apps ended up being the most pressing places where they needed to go, and the ed tech equity conversations never happened in those unconferences because you, you allow participants the option to use the law of two feet and go where they need to go, and so they were kind of going to the professional learning they needed most, and I was, I guess I, one of the reasons I wanted to tweet out this hashtag was that, you know, I kind of wanted to know what they had to say that day, and I understand you know, wanting to get on top of Google Apps and be able to, to leverage digital tools and, you know, and writing instruction. I, I love it. At the same time, I, I felt like, you know, I want to hear what they had to say. I mean, I've, I've certainly, you know, opened my mouth about equity with that tech a number of times, and I just appreciate Edward popping in today because it's a topic that resonates with him, and, I, and I'm interested in how the topic resonates with students. I've also recently been interviewed by middle school students, both one time Skyping in with Jack Zangerly from the Hudson Valley Writing Project. I had to wake up early so a few of his students could interview me as an expert, you know, aha expert. And then recently I did an interview with, uh, with the eighth grade boy at a school in my district. And those middle school students were asking me questions about equity of access in classrooms. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to try to surface a larger conversation. And just finally, that Nicole's piece has stuck with me ever since I read it. And so I wanted to revisit that. Do you want to say more about that piece? Um, and then, Nicole, do you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, so what stuck with me about Nicole's piece was the idea that um, Nicole wrote about, the title was, you know, we, I'm going to paraphrase the title, which is we need to stop uh, painting youth as hackers or digital deviants and start characterizing, you know, student personal use of devices as as innovation. So we can't label students in our sort of hasty efforts to get devices in classrooms and prepare for online testing or in our vision to teach in one-to-one -one ways. We can't 
we can't go to go so fast or get so wrapped up in our adult conversations and planning that we forget that we can fix labels on students who don't deserve them. We need to keep our eyes open about equity and probably even keep the students' voices um, at the forefront in equity. And Nicole, I think, helps students conduct action research in LA about about just that that labeling. So that's about as bad as I want to butcher Nicole's piece before I let her speak. Jump in, Nicole. No, that was great, Joe. Um, yeah, I just I, I, I found myself drawn to the media coverage that was going on around Los Angeles. Uh, people might have heard about it around the country. Uh, we've had a big iPad fiasco here in Los Angeles. Um, the goal of the LAUSD superintendent was to give iPads to every student in the district. Um, it was done in a way that was not the most well thought out. Uh, and it was done mostly for the purposes of getting students to take online Common Core assessments rather than giving them transformative learning opportunities. Um, and I found that when the rollout did not go as planned and when students found ways to use the devices in creative ways and access music or digital content, uh, the media did not spend a lot of time talking about the things that adults had, had done poorly and they spent a lot more time characterizing the young people as uh, hackers or as deviants and as somehow doing something wrong as opposed to uh, exploring and I was struck by the fact that uh, when students use technology the way that adults want them to we were very excited about it and we call it 21st century learning um, but when young people use technology in ways that they find interesting and creative we think that it's dangerous and something that has to be controlled um, and I just think that that's uh, not giving a lot of credit to young people and their own capacity for creative expression and learning. So I just wanted to write about the student perspective uh, from one of the schools that had gotten a lot of bad press, which is Roosevelt High School in East LA. Uh, they had had the iPad rollout at their school and a lot of their students were interviewed and characterized as uh, kind of poor students or people that were breaking the rules by getting into the iPads. Um, so I just wanted to show that Roosevelt students themselves had a counter story to tell. Um, so a few of us from UCLA and a few of their teachers kind of helped young people to create their own PowerPoint presentations and video documentaries to show that uh, the portrayal of their school and the portrayal of them was not accurate and that it was hurtful and that they had much more to say in their community themselves from their own perspective. Um, so that's kind of the conversation I just wanted to start because a lot of times adults think they know uh, number one, adults think that they know how young people should act online uh, and they infantilize them and there are dangers out there but I think that we need to trust young people a little bit more to, to learn with us and to manage those manage the online world together because they usually know a lot more than we do. So just to say if, if this is your first time here I, it, I don't like it to come back to me so please jump in. <laughs> Let's make it a real conversation for him. Um, I had a question Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. for Nicole. Um, Nicole, I was kind of looking over your article there, and and um, it looked like what you did and what those students then presented to the community actually did go. I well, I guess I'm wondering, did it go a long way toward? Um, changing those perceptions? Because it looks pretty promising what you have written here. Yeah, I think that there's always a push. Um, when you're doing research with young people, I think that uh, our young people were really empowered by the process of, of sharing their voice, developing their voice, and uh, going through the research process of developing a question and seeing it through. And uh, the community members that were in attendance were really, really positive and really excited. Um, the difficult part about youth research is that oftentimes change is painfully slow. Um, the iPad situation at Roosevelt has not been resolved adequately. Uh, they've been taken away, given back, and they're still in flux. So, um, but I do feel like young people felt like they had made progress by having their voices heard. It's difficult to balance that sense of empowerment with the sense that adults don't always move quickly enough to change things or to uh, make things better. But I think that um, just knowing those skills that they have now and knowing that they have the ability to present to their administration and their staff 
and their community um, helped to heal some of the hurt that they had from the way that they were portrayed in the media. Um, and we, I think that if we get more students to put their stories out there, I think that can only be a good thing. That's a great theme. Uh, so if somebody's just tuning in here, uh, what are we talking about tonight? So. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead. So uh, there are a couple of things that are running through my mind, and I think the first one is, um, you know, when you think about sort of the challenges of, of that were happened during the rollout of the iPads in Los Angeles, you have two things. You have race. Uh, well, a couple. You have race, class. Um, so you've got those perceptions, and then you have this tech piece, which I think is really interesting. Um, and this might be my own naivety in, in some ways, but you don't associate, um, oh gosh, I even hate to say it, you don't necessarily associate hacking with people of color, right? Because there's a, sort of this associated, um, in my mind, I'm going to own this, this association between um, what we see the sort of hacker um, versus the reality in regards to what our kids are, you know, good or bad capable of. And so I just think it's so interesting, this conversation. And I hate that I just said that out loud, um, but it's true. Like, I, you know, when you say hacker, my, my impression is white male, right? Like, and, and not young, but sort of like middle age that's very seasoned. And so it's just an interesting conundrum in my mind, um, it, this this conversation and this idea of deviance, even the word deviance and these sort of associations that are attached to it. Um, you know, what do you, when you say deviant, what do you see? You know, so then you add this other layer in and I think it's, I think it's really complex because I would imagine that um, lots of school districts with very large populations of students of color in particular or um, free and reduced, those sort of um, indicators that that are we use in public education, you add this layer and it's a whole nother kind of conversation. And so we probably see these inequities play out all the time, but haven't really labeled them. So I, I find this conversation to be incredibly fascinating um, in that way and challenging my own biases about um, how we see and how we label kids, but in particular those demographics that I think are really, um, really interesting in that way. So that that's my out loud thinking. Thank you for that. <laughs> Other thoughts? Yeah, and there's a sense of, especially that whole, like, we pass them out, we take them away. It's like, we spend a bill, I mean, not to, not to just pile on LA Unified, but, you know, the idea that you spent a billion dollars and you know, let's just make sure that the kids don't break them. And one of the things I'm struck by recently is just like noticing how adults with their smartphones, the, the people I work with, will use those things and just abuse them until they are cracked and broken and the adult smartphones are almost falling apart. And everybody has a friend who probably has the most janky looking iPhone. And the reality is when, when adults get devices and use them to our own personal, you know, preferences and to really personalize them, we bang them up. And so, yeah, which students do we pull the iPads away and lock them, behind, lock them in the cart? You know, I mean, I mean, if we spent the money to, to open up all kinds of access for students, let's not be putting them back in the cart and sending some kind of message that the other students get to use them and these students don't. I think that's, that's the theme of Nicole's piece that sticks with me. Well, that, like, trust piece, too, you know, because... The school that my kids go to is, is very affluent. It's a private day school. You should I could count on my hands the number of times I've seen iPads just laying out in the hallway. And then you go to another school and they're locked up, right? Like because we can't trust can't trust the kids. So it's very interesting um, that you that you said that. Very interesting. If I could jump in, I have a comment on the um, on the Los Angeles. We had a, uh, just an art perspective from over here, we, we uh, this was last year, I believe, because it, uh, it came out in the paper, and I remember um, that day, uh, our district had shut down our Wi-Fi, and, um, or not, they, they put some new blocks in it where we couldn't get onto YouTube, and we couldn't get onto Prezi, 
And that year we were doing eighth grade, and we were the only school that had a, we were the only classroom that had laptops, and every day the kids were, um, every day they were blogging and they were using their Prezi. So um, I, I, th I put up as an inspirational piece, I put up the article that had come up in the LA Times, and then I said, um, you know, if these kids could figure it out, what do you think, uh, 10 imaginary dollars to whoever can figure out how we can use YouTube today. And sure enough, within about uh, 20, 30 minutes, a couple of students had figured out how we could still use YouTube to do Prezi. And um, we were able to get around most of that. And then um, it, it was funny. So we, we actually used that as kind of an inspirational piece. We said, uh, I, I told them, are the, are, the, are the kids from down in Los Angeles, are they really going to be that much smarter than us that they could figure out how to go around the blocks? Or can we, can we go ahead and keep uh, class rolling? Because if, if it doesn't work out, we're going to be going back into the textbooks today. And they figured it out. So it was... Just a just a different perspective on how that went <laughs> that day. Interesting. So that's awesome. Oh. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say that's awesome to hear. Uh, that, and I know the kids have creative ways to get around those roadblocks that we try to put up for them. Uh, I did see I posted in the chat box on the other page uh, an article that I saw today uh, that was featured in the New York Times, and I think it was really interesting because. I think we spend a lot of time on thinking about equity when it comes to the devices themselves, like, like who gets to have the iPads in their hands or the laptops or the phones, and what sites can they access. Um, but I think what's more interesting to me is the, is the learning that's happening with the devices, because I think a lot of people just think that magically the device is going to create some kind of magical uh, online learning uh, without any kind of input from the student or the teacher. Um, but uh, the study that just came out is that, um, based on income, students' media literacy skills online really differ. So that when we get iPads in kids' hands and then we say, go, on, go ahead and Google this topic, we assume that kids know what that means, yeah. um, but that actually stu students' skills about what it means to Google and how to evaluate online sources, that all has to be taught. That's not something that magically happens when you go online that you just know. Um, so I think the pedagogy of using devices in the classroom uh, like I think there's a lot of equity issues there that we also need to talk about about what it means to do that and what do we ask our students to do online like for what purpose because the purpose can't be the technology itself. Nicole, I'm I'm jumping ahead in, in your story there a little bit, but um, pretty quickly what you just said though suggests that kids who don't have access at home to all all the tools. Um, need to be taught and need to be told and need to be showed, you know, shown how to do things, and then they don't. Then the freedom that Monica and that's why I really wanted you as part of this conversation um, emphasizes gets lost, right? So how do we how do we deal with that paradox? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's about. I mean, that that gets to that whole idea of do we see ourselves as facilitators? versus, you know, the stage on the stage. So I think there's certain technical aspects of using devices that, uh, that are taught uh, or that are, we guide students through. Uh, and then there's what, what we allow them to do with those skills once they have them is where you start to let go and let them go off and explore their own interests and their own passions. So I think it's a constant balancing act, especially for, for the, the uh, high school districts that I've worked in where there, there's so much top-down control that it's hard to kind of shake that off and embrace the bottom-up kind of mode of, of teaching with technology. So I think that uh, I'd love to hear how other people are approaching that tension too. Monica, do you have anything to add at this point? Well, um, you know, within the, again, the confines that we're in, if there already is this assumed um, compulsory curriculum that you know were to be about um, that kind of compromises um, the whole thing I I think it we've all said it I think it has to do a lot with trust and um, to me trust is like an all-or-nothing thing it's not like a it's not a deal that you made it's just do you trust the person to be human and yeah they're gonna make mistakes and I also think if you if you are then in that element of trust, um, trusting that the learning will come, thinking of learning to walk, um, and talk, those things are learned which are you know 
pretty sophisticated by modeling. So if we do have that element of trust, which I agree, we, we don't, and so it's, that's, that's the conundrum right now. But if we do have that element of trust, then it, you know, anybody in that space, you know, whatever age you are, whatever title you have, is free to follow their whimsy and be curious. And then Googling is modeled. What do you do when something bad comes up is modeled, you know. So um, in my mind now, it's, it's like this all or, all or nothing thing if we want it to, if we, if we don't want it to be so difficult. Um, a lot of us don't have that choice right now. Um, so that's where the difficulty, I think, comes, is that we're not allowing this trust to, to really be full-blown. So the story that, that I tell and is, or could tell more details on, is, is that my school, when we started, you know, we, we had laptops in every kid's hands, and um, we, that's how we wanted it to be. And for me, I, you know, I've been teaching that way for, for quite a few years and had a lot of ideas about what I wanted kids to do on them and how, how, they, could, how they could use those tools to raise their voice and to be, you know, really makers of, online. Um, whereas some of the other teachers I was working with didn't have the, that pedagogy, didn't have that kind of experience. And so what, what kids ended up doing was coming in and listening to music sites, coming in and watching you know, Netflix, coming in and not paying attention to... Um, I would like to say two things. I, I hear the compulsory curriculum, but they're also not paying attention to their own voices, right? They're not... They're not present. They're, they're, they're consumers. They're coming in as consumers and they're acting as consumers. So, so what happened was teachers just stopped using the machines, right? <laughs> so, so they could get the kids' attention. So I don't know where the question is in that story, but I, like, I don't want to prescribe what kids do on the machines, but I, at the same time, I want them to use them as tools for power, not tools for, you know, not just bring in what's, you know, the consumer culture that's there already. Yeah, I think, I think a couple things, one of the things I think about is, you know, yeah, I, I've definitely seen teachers who first time they, they have sort of one-to-one -one access they come with concerns saying, you know, I asked the students to research and they're finding all this junk. And effectively it's, you know, it's like search skills, right? Mm -hmm. And that, and, and I, you know, I always, I mean, I certainly have strategies I recommend and questions I ask. Although I do think that what Nicole has done, what she framed in the article is, you know, it, it's, it's beyond search skills. It's the idea that, hey, you know, there's a level of research that you can do that doesn't really involve Google. And it might involve creating some media and, you know, and creating a call to action. And it might involve surveying your peers or interviewing someone. And I think, you know, again, having, having just recently been interviewed by students 11 to 14, and just knowing that this is a question that interests them, and I think that tech equity, while it sparks a conversation among adults, it also might spark a really good cross-generational conversation. Because I think that, you know, when Edward mentioned the availability of swap meets in L.A. and the lack of those swap meets where he is now, I mean, that is news to me. And that is probably something that is really impactful for students in L.A. if they have this swap meet kind of, you know, a lot more of a grassroots access opportunity. That's powerful. And, you know, what else might we find out if we ask students how they're getting access? or the access gaps that mean the most to them. So part of it Yeah, I keep thinking to myself that... Sorry. No, you go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no you go ahead. Chris. Oh, uh, well, um, part of it seems to me uh, that it's, you know, it's about the students, um, you know, like in Nicole's piece, the students kind of saying, we want to be part of, our voice should be part of the media story. Um, and, um, you know, Edward's students 
you throw in the challenge to them saying we've got to figure this out. Um, you know, part of it is that thing where we've got to teach them agency in a certain way, but then, you know, there's this thing like, well, what's the platform? And, and I look at the work that uh, Joe Pariso and her students are doing in Oakland, uh, you know, at a inner city big Oakland high school, um, the way that they've uh, brought that the agency to change community through their education and having a blogging platform to do it seems to me like that's a big part of equity is somehow getting that idea to people that uh, you know you you make a difference and it's happening with the student of mine too where uh, he's just on fire now and uh, now they're he and a friend are researching um, their one of the cities right by me is actually uh, came up on one of the most racially imbalanced um, police forces in the United States. It was up there with Ferguson, and they were surprised by that. And now they're they're investigating that more in their own hometown. It's like, well, why is that if our our population is nearly forty percent Hispanic, and the police force is you know five percent Caucasian? what is going on there and so they're really uh, really fired up about that and so I think it's this combination of somehow getting the idea of agency and then somehow getting people to know what to do with that agency. Ooh, I'd, I'd love to chime in on that. Um, one of the things that I think was really impactful during um, the couple of weeks there where folks were on the ground and tweeting about Ferguson was the um, the level of sophistication of, of folks that would perceivably be um, considered um, living in poverty in that particular area that were um, on it when it came to on the ground reporting and tweeting and, and, and you know um, sending photos and, and giving people inside access into a community that probably outside of this event wouldn't necessarily um, be seen by anyone, with the exception of those who live locally. And so, it, it, you know, I think that um, one of the things that I, I, uh, I that, that's sort of popping into my head with all of this is um, the sort of level of, um, of impact um, that our kids do have. And, you know, I remember one gentleman in particular that tweeted the entire time this event was happening um, and was able to give and have video of of the after directly after the shooting of, of um, Michael um, Brown and so it it's just an interesting um, conundrum on one on one end we're looking at the sort of in school uses of technology um, and we're saying that kids are you know that there's this sort of disconnect and then you look outside of school and it's amazing what's happening and what kids are are able to do and so if it hadn't been for folks on the ground using their beat-up iPhones um, to tweet what's happening, would the world have known in such detail um, what had occurred in, in, in Ferguson? So it, it was such an interesting um, dynamic, and, and seeing these young people use their phones and, and technology in the way that they did. Go ahead, Dave. Is it Edward, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, I can, if I can jump in. Yeah. One of the... The biggest differences I noticed and in, in terms of uh, uh, well we'll see how we plug it in but last year I, I had a I would have my, my higher class and my lower class with my higher class I could give them that freedom to go and jump in and they can they can get into uh, what I wanted them to to get into and kind of find their own way make their own thing but with my my lower class I found myself having to make a, a lot of the structure so if we're doing a, we had this program called Go Animate, and they get to type in with avatars, and it and it animates the whole deal. Well, I would have to help um, scaffold or frame everything all the way through the animation process for them. Well, what I learned this year was um, I have kids who are actually actually lower, but um, that that little writing process because they didn't know the the writing process as it was that kind of held them back with the technology part. But when I introduced them to something like SketchUp and it didn't require really any math or any writing, they were able to succeed just as quickly as students who were more proficient with their math and their writing, and they felt good about it. So I think um, if then I guess you could plug that into equity is what programs aren't going to uh, require that crutch of 
already being a solid writer or already knowing your math. And um, and these are things that kids, they would be able to jump in quickly when they're doing SketchUp, the 3D modeling, and then start pulling and pushing and making houses, and they get excited, but it didn't require them to already be proficient in these other areas. Yeah, and I could echo that with, with L students, that that tends to be true, too, when we can use programs and visual tools and so forth, that they can still tell their stories, but not necessarily know the language yet. Um, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's interesting. So I'm curious, because it seems like the, the, the tech equity conversation is kind of, we're all over the place, and I certainly have my own sort of vis vision of what, what I think this might mean. How, how are we going to define, or how are we defining tech equity? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Joe, um, get to it. I mean, you really want something practical, and you want you want a hashtag, and a, I mean, you want an ongoing program you got going here, right? I mean, so what what's your vision of that? What's the, yeah, just echo that question. Yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of a hashtag and a regular Twitter chat, I guess that's, I feel like, you know, it's almost trailing edge, a trailing edge, like, conversation media to start a regular Twitter chat and keep that hashtag, of course, it's open, right? Um, the idea that we might just build on things like Ed Chat and Ing Chat. And, you know, at a time right now where I, I feel like Nicole's piece was really timely, at the same time, those issues are going to be popping up as new for different people all around the nation and you know, at different times. And even as I was tweeting out, I was hearing from, you know, a colleague I met through CL MOOC this summer from Egypt, Maha Bali. I hope I didn't get her name wrong. I think I've got her name right. But, you know, the topic of ed tech equity resonated with her because of what she sees in Cairo. And I guess what I would like to do is make sure that, you know, certainly there's, there's certain pains I feel as somebody who is can influence but certainly doesn't control the process of access in, in my school district. There are sort of local pains that I feel but I also feel like this is a big, this is a big conversation that I don't want to be limited by, you know, my my frame, my local frame, and the idea that, you know, Maha might encourage her colleagues and her students to tweet to this hashtag to talk about what tech equity means. I expect that I would be really quickly educated by the tweets that came from Cairo, as much as I might be educated by the tweets that might come from Edward's class if we created the hashtag too. And I guess that's the I guess that's the promise, right, of a Twitter hashtag is that it's simple enough that, you know, heck I can I could probably figure out how to do the logistical parts on my own. I know four or five people who can help me. But the idea that, you know, the the importance of it and the timeliness of it globally, it seems like this is a place we can we can ask students to chime in too. And maybe it's a because Schools are being pressed in different ways, certainly, but kind of uniformly right now. It's a it's an educational opportunity if we don't, I mean, in my position, like, I don't want to get so nervous about the situation that I can't talk about it openly. That it makes me, it, may, it bums me out that certain people have helped us learn how to teach in one-to-one -one classrooms, therefore they've had access for four years, whereas other teachers are saying, hey, when the heck do my students get access? And that... I mean, that bugs me every time I hear it. At the same time, I have to help capitalize on the learning. But, you know, it's more about a conversation that educates us versus, you know, let me complain to you about how hard it sometimes is in my local setting. Yeah, I wanted to jump in and add, for just from this conversation, I can see different levels of the edtequity uh, hashtag conversations. So there's this idea of equity of access to the devices themselves, because we obviously still don't have ac equitable access to uh, high-speed internet and to devices across different communities. So that's one level is the actual having access and devices. Yeah. I mean, uh, even, then, even iPads compared to you know, other tools, but go. <laughs> yeah, de yeah, yeah, definitely. And then what you were speaking to, Paul, Paul is another level yeah. of another another level of equity is then. Uh, who gets to be producers versus who gets to be consumers uh, of information that that flows online? So that's an, that's another level of equity is is uh, who gets whose voice gets to be heard and what do you get to do with that tool? Uh, if 
if teachers aren't comfortable and they use the iPad as a, another notepad as opposed to other schools that are being able to give their kids experiences of publishing their voices and sharing them, then that's another issue of equity. Uh, and then I think the third issue of equity is just what the purpose is. I, I try to always remind myself, what am I getting out of technology in this particular lesson that I couldn't get without technology? Because if I can do it without it, then it, I mean, technology is just a tool to get to that connection between human beings and between human beings and ideas. So technology is not always the answer. I think connection is always the answer. Um, so I need, I think with equity, we need to look at what can technology bring us that we couldn't get any other way? What is the new thing it's bringing us that helps my students get to that next level of understanding or analysis or production? Uh, and I think those are all going to be important questions moving forward, especially with the Common Core, which mentions technology but never really talks about what we use it for. It says that we should produce and publish writing on internet spaces, but like we're saying, we could either be having students post um, ideas about an essay that's only for their classmates to see, or we could have them posting about things like Ferguson or issues in their community that they've done their own research about, and those are very different uses of the internet and very different kinds of voice. So I think those are all uh, topics that I think can really be explored through this, this hashtag. Well, thanks. Um, anybody want to follow that? <laughs> Monica, can I point back to your earlier comment about give it um, the equity for you is about everybody being able to give it a go? I think that's how you said it. Sure. Um, just that's the point. Um, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's how you're pointing at me. Um, I, what I would recommend, um, if you haven't seen it, and I'm, I don't have the other one open, but I'm throwing it in here, is um, Neil Gershenfeld, um, his TED Talk, and specifically his concept of personal fabrication. Um, and this is going towards, yeah, that sounds wonderful and utopian to give everyone spaces of permission, but it's not feasible. It, you know, it's too chaotic. Um, the first thing that I would say to that is if, if we did just, if we were able to say no more to, to where we're spending all our money, if we were to upcycle education resources, we would have more than enough to have Wi-Fi and devices per choice for everyone. Um, so there's that. And then um, for the, the side of what if you do give people these spaces of permission and they don't know what to do or they do things that aren't good, um, Neil just has just an amazing experience um, and a resolution to it. Um, personal fabrication was something he offered a class at MIT that you could make whatever you wanted to make. And he just was blown away by how many people signed up for that class. And what he realized was in the developing country um, that we are hungry to do something that we love. You know, um, one girl made a, a bag that she could scream into when she got really stressed and no sound came out. Then she could go someplace else and the scream would come out. So there was no judgment of how ridiculous what you made was. Um, then they, the class decided, well, does this just work here at MIT where we have whatever we want? You know. So they took it to, um, I think I said that wrong before, they took it to developing countries. And um, what they found there is because of the idea of personal fabrication and you could make whatever you want, there weren't these high and lofty saviors coming in to tell you what you needed. They had the tools to, to make the survival things that they needed or to solve the problems that they needed. Um, so anyway, that would just be my plug for personal fabrication. And um, we do have the means um, to not only resource ourselves, um, but also if, and the way he phrases it is this personal fabrication gives people something else to do. He was actually talking to the military about it, and they were wanting his smarts to create better military tools. And he was saying, you know, even we wouldn't even have wars if, if everyone had something better to do. If everyone could do the thing they couldn't not do, we wouldn't have people thinking they had to inspect people. We wouldn't have people thinking they had to you know, fight for things. So anyway, that's my suggestion there. 
great. Can, 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 can you address that question I asked way at the beginning, and then it's come up a couple other times, of um, too often kids of means and, and who have skills already um, are given freedom, and it's easier for them to set up their own networks and, you know, go off on their own, whereas kids who, you know, don't have the tools at home and don't have the means are, you know, stuck into classes to learn, you know, <laughs> to learn good citizenship on, online, or, or maybe not that bad, but <laughs> have you thought about that issue, Monica, or anybody? Well, again, I, I go to the spot where if equity is everyone getting a go every day, we don't define what that go is, or we won't see the amazing things that people can do. Um, and so the equity, I don't see it happening. I mean, there's amazing things happening everywhere. So it's getting things, some things are getting better. But I don't see it happening as long as we have this preconceived thing of what needs to be done. Um, so, so you say, you know, a lot of people with affluence, maybe they have more experience with things, but we've pointed out, you know, with Ferguson, there's people that we wouldn't have guessed had, you know, experience. Um, it's just that we're not trusting people, and then once they do something, we're judging it right away, you know. Um, so that goes back to Nicole's article as well. Um, mm -hmm. Um, Kalanius, um, I, I I don't have your name right. Say it again. Uh oh, Kalinus. Kalinus, sorry. Yeah. You you I mean you started this round a little bit saying that you wanted to kind of define what for you what this term means and and I did just see um it, and I didn't see this before either Joe do you want to say um the the uh, the hashtags been shortened. To <laughs> looks like it's tequila. tequila. Yeah, tequila. <laughs> so the discussion was fun because at first it was I was surprised that ed tech equity had never hadn't been used. Mm -hmm. So I started out with ed tech equity, and then the point that was well taken was uh, that was too many, too many characters. I was gonna squash some people's voice there. So uh, then we heard uh, techquity. The one that looked more like tequila came from Egypt from Maha, and then Anna Smith uh, offered T-E-C-H-Q-U-I-T-Y. And usually I just defer to Anna on all things Twitter. She's kind of like my Twitter editor. The, yeah, the act is in there already, so that's interesting. Techquity. Yeah. So I think we're, you know... Is that where you are right now? You're at Techquity? So T-E-C-H-Q-U-I-T-Y is the leader right now. Okay. All other deals are all other details are negotiable. So, <laughs> so let's let's go around and, and say what what you think. Uh, what I mean, Nicole, your your summary was so wonderful. But other people throw in now what what you what you think you want to see in this hashtag. Is that well, fair? Yeah. I'll I'll start. Um, um, I you know when I so I have a hard time with the tech and the equity, putting, putting them together, because I tend to think in regards to access, um, and I, I'm just reading through the um, New York Times article, and now I'm just as confused and fascinated all over again, but um, I the also one, think, The one that Nicole referred to earlier? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's a, there's a part of me that looks at equity, right? The, 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 the idea of, of um, sort of what what happens when, you know, when um, people are missing or things that, or not people are missing, but things are missing that people don't have access to or are experiencing and therefore is causing them to um, be in a position where, it, you know, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, whatever it may be. So there's that piece of me that feels like um, this might, that might be a, an area that we need to sort of look at, which is why I felt really um, interested in the the um, New York, the the Los Angeles piece because you know when I look at um, language and the way that language was used to describe a group of kids and then my own sort of perceptions of what I think all this means it's it's just really interesting and then you add 
and the only example I have really is Ferguson um, because of you know sort of uh, this idea that these are folks and this is just sort of the the rhetoric around the uh, the folks who live in this area not having access yet providing access into their communities in ways that we haven't seen before um, I think I was reading something where um, Twitter just the Mike Brown hashtag took over Twitter right and so there were all age groups and all racial backgrounds folks were responding to this and it was really intriguing to me so to see sort of this lack of access or lack of access to certain resources and yet you have this sort of online movement it, so it's all fascinating to me and, that, and that's why I was sort of like how are we defining um, Tequity because I tend to think of it a little bit differently but maybe um, maybe not so I appreciate it um, Nicole's summary because it, it it definitely begins sort of a framework and I don't want to use I'll, I'll use that loosely um, but it definitely begins to sort of set the stage for I think a really large robust conversation um, mm -hmm. that can have a meaningful impact so I'm excited well, thank you for your contribution there too Edward your last thoughts here tonight <laughs> or doesn't have to be your last thoughts. But. All right. Well, uh, my last ones. I actually had been. I I kind of went through the the article right now, but um, I had I had been recently thinking about it, and um, not so much at what is the equity, but is this uh, is this another foot race that that a lot of kids are bound to lose, and that and so I I do see technology as being a, an equalizer, but I just uh, seeing the equity, the equity that's not there. I, I so, sometimes I would feel looking at, at students, is, is this a foot race that, that they're gonna lose without that without even starting out on a on an even plane. And, what, do you, uh, what do you mean by foot race? I think I know, but can you break that down a little bit? Um, well, depending on where you are, your education could be better, depending on what teams are or what setups are around. Maybe in sports you would have people who are more willing to sponsor you. So if you were in this city compared to this city, in this city there'd be somebody who'd be willing to to help you join these teams and do this. Um, depending on what kind of tutoring, what everything that's available to you, devices, do you know is the internet available? Is there like here in this city there's one Starbucks and the Starbucks is a couple of a few miles away from everybody. So you know, a lot of the kids have to flock over to the Starbucks to to try and get internet, or else they'll find themselves sitting at the sitting on the yard, but um, it just, uh, you know, I just, I, I would feel that way sometimes, you know, is this another foot race that, uh, is this really the great equalizer, or is this going to be uh, just another foot race for them that, that they're going to fall behind on? And I haven't answered that yet on my own. <laughs> Chris? You've been watching the chat too, right? You're yeah. Again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think Eddie's points there and, you know, some others are, you know, it's pretty uh, disturbing for us. Um, but I still go back to, um, you know, just maybe through inquiry helping people find agency and then finding that outlet so that they can be heard um, seems to be a big part of what I try to do. Do you... Can you just say another sentence about inquiry, though? What is? Yeah, so I mean, I'm thinking again of um, these students that are are pretty interested in their latest project, and it started with a question that um, they were really surprised that this AP story came out about racially imbalanced police forces, um, and you know, like a lot of them were in urban areas. Well, I don't remember, but I mean, there was Ferguson and there was like this town in Utah, which really struck them, and it was their hometown. So that question is kind of driving their. Did, but and did did they get sorry, but did they did they get there because of some freedom freedom to explore anything that you gave them? Yeah, yeah. So things are pretty wide open right now. It's in a media class, and um, we're looking for stories that. Um, I'm saying we're doing you know through January, so it's got to be something that can uh, last mm -hmm. and that's one that really seems to last so right now they're coming across like um, you know what well, what's the community trying to do about it 
and they came across like, for instance, uh, an explorer program where they're trying to um, get minority youth interested in law enforcement, which is an interesting part of that puzzle. So, but anyway, their question is driving their, I think, their sense of agency because they feel like they can tell a story that matters. And then the question is, you know, so you've got to get people listening to that story. Nicole or Monica, anything to add? I, mean, I think that uh, I'm excited to see where the conversation goes. I think that all the issues that everyone's spoken to today really get to how Joe really tapped into something here by getting people to start talking about this. Um, and I just keep going back to this idea of what do we want to get out of, what can technology do for us that we couldn't do before? And I think one of the major things is being able to, uh, like Kalinas was talking about, get that counter narrative out there so that you know, that's where I went for news when I wanted to know what was really going on on the ground in Ferguson because I wasn't getting that perspective from mainstream media. And so I think this could really, really be a powerful tool for students from marginalized communities to find their voice and find an audience. Um, and I think that what, what that can do for literacy skills in school and out of school can be really amazing. So I'm excited to see where this conversation goes. Great. Thank you. Joe, you get last word here. Oh, lucky me. <clears throat> and I truly do feel lucky because I, I really appreciate Nicole jumping in because I've wanted, I've wanted to talk about her article since I read it, and so this was such a fabulous opportunity. I'm, I really thank everybody for showing up and, and uh, just a great hour. You know, especially, Eddie, I really appreciate that you popped on kind of on a lark, and I just appreciate your contributions because it helps me think about, you know, your location. I guess my hope for the hashtag is that the students who've been expressing an interest in ed tech and equity locally here in Aurora, I hope that there's an open channel where they can go for the real picture. And I hope that they discover that, that you know, they might be able to, you know, learn some lessons from LA or, you know, get inspired or get fired up by what they find on that hashtag. And then I also hope that, you know, if in fact students here in my community reach out on that hashtag, I also hope they run into some posts from Egypt and I hope they bump into some of Maha's writing because she's written about how the more she studies education online, people take for granted that everyone could have a smartphone or everyone could even buy an ebook. And she talks about how in Cairo, the difference between zero dollars and one dollar can online can be huge for a population that doesn't own credit cards and a dollar is, you know, an unreachable amount. And so I think that the idea that when we open these channels, we know that we help our students, you know, access a voice or develop their own voices, but we also have no idea what they might learn if we open them well enough. And so I guess that's my hope for it. Sounds good. Sounds like the next thing, one of the next things we could do is get some students on talking about this too. Um, so that's always a good way to end. Um, thank you all for uh, being here tonight. Um, we're here every Wednesday, and uh, through October, we will be uh, focusing in on connected learning and um, that whole uh, connected learning month that's happening um, through Teacher Innovator and uh, others, other places uh, with the National Writing Project and so forth. I'm sure I got some of those words wrong there. Uh, you, you, you'll find it. Anyway, <laughs> I come back here when you'd like. We uh, broadcast um, over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. Thanks to Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier for um, all their support there. And thank you all for coming tonight. Good night. Hey, Paul, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> free. What is next week's topic? Um, we, we, we do want to do some kickoff of the, connect, the Connected Learning Month. Um, so, and Christina Cantrell is helping me think about that. So, um, you know, what is connected learning? What does it mean to us as teachers? Um, is a big topic, and we're kind of narrowing that down by who can come. But come on back anytime. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye, everyone.